Hey everybody, your friendly neighborhood Uncle Pete here, and this is my series, Nails in the Coffin, where we learned that with great kills, there must also come great nails. Welcome back to my channel, or welcome to my channel. If you are new here and you want to learn what Nails in a Coffin is all about, you can read the description and the section down below. Thanks a lot. So, today I am continuing my venture into some giallo films. Last week I covered Dario Gento's Deep Red, and the week before that I talked about Lamberto Bava's A Blade in the Dark. This week I'm going to nail a giallo from 1971 from Lamberto Bava's father, Mario Bava's A Bay of Blood. This movie is also known as, I should say, Twitch of the Death Nerve. This film holds a significant importance, and I think it really served definitely as a major influence on movies that contribute to the creation of the slasher genre. One example is Friday the 13th Part 2 pays homage to one of the kills in this movie. Um, and there's a lot of homages. Once you watch Friday the 13th, you'll see a lot of influence that they got from A Bay of Blood. I really much enjoyed uh, Lamberto Bava's um, A Blade in the Dark. So let's find out how his father's movie does with my nails in the coffin. When the movie starts, guess what? We're on a bay. Who would have thought? Um, there's a mansion on this bay, and the person who owns it, Contessa Federica Donati, she's a wheelchair-bound elderly woman. She's turning in for night, turning off lights around the house, and she goes into one of the rooms. She's attacked by a mystery assailant. This person wraps a noose around her neck, knocks the wheelchair out from under her. She's too high up to use her arms, and she doesn't have to use her for legs, so she is hung to death. An early death in this early giallo film, only five minutes in, and we're already get to nail someone. We're going to give Contessa Donati two nails in the coffin. You know, there wasn't much she could have done here. She was an old woman in a wheelchair. By the time she saw the killer, or who that person was, he had already put a noose around her neck, and then he quickly kicked the chair out from under her. And there wasn't much she could have done there because she was too high up to use her arms to press, you know, remove any pressure, and she didn't have to use her for legs, and I really didn't see her make any stupid or foolish decisions here. So when the person doesn't stand a chance of surviving, they really didn't have much of an option, I would normally go down the middle and give them two nails in a coffin. We next find out who the killer is, and it is the Countess's husband, Count Filippo Donati. Filippo is standing there admiring work, and then he hears a noise at the front door. He leaves the room where he just killed his wife, walks down the long hallway to the front door, and he goes to check, opens the door, but he really doesn't find anything. There is nothing out front, so Filippo goes back into the room where his now dead wife is hanging, and he places a forged suicide note uh, from the Countess on the table. He walks up to the body, bends down to do something, and then we see light glare off of a knife's blade, and this mystery killer stabs the Count in the back multiple times, killing him. I'm going to award the Count one and a half nails on the coffin. He was stabbed in the back and didn't see it coming. However, he just killed his wife, and then he heard a noise outside and no one was there. He went back to things as if they were normal. I guess he definitely doesn't have any spidey senses. Also, this is another kill in a movie where there's barely any light in the house. If I was to count and I had just killed my wife, I love you MJ, um, right after I heard a noise and I went to go check out and I found nothing, I'd be really suspicious. If someone's playing ding dong ditch or something in the middle of the night and then, then no one's there. I'd have more lights on in the house to see if anybody else was in there. I'd be looking around to see if there's anybody else in the house. Especially after I heard a noise and there was nobody there. I feel like it's a safe bet to say that his ego stopped him from checking his surroundings. Which is why he's lucky to only get the one and a half nails in the coffin. Real estate agent Frank and his love of Laura, they collaborated with Filippo on a plan to convince the Contessa to sell her estate. Little did they know that now Filippo met an untimely demise, which kind of screws up their little plan. We meet Duke, Bobby, Denise, and Brunhild, four teenagers from the local area. They decide to explore the seemingly abandoned hotel. They explore it, they're partying, having fun. Bobby kind of had ho hopes to hook up with Brunhild while Duke and Denise were pairing up, but Brunhild was party size a little too much with Bobby, and Denise isn't quite ready yet for some hanky panky. The group further explores the property and they find a pool, but it's in no condition to go swimming in. So Brunhild decides to go take a dip in the bay while the other three find the Countess's deserted mansion and they start exploring. While they're exploring, Brunhild goes for a nice little skinny dip in the bay, a lot of which which I cannot show. While she's enjoying her swim, she's horrified when she finds the bloated corpse of Filippo that was disposed of in the bay. 
She gets out of the water, runs back to the hotel where she left her friends, but they're not there since they're now at the mansion. So she sees something, gets scared, and she runs out of the building. So she's now running through the woods towards the mansion. She turns and screams when she sees the killer following her. So she's just about to make it to the mansion, but the killer catches up to her and slashes her across the throat with a bill hook. Brunhilde gets the next set of nails, and she earned herself a respectable two and a half nails in a coffin. She ran when she was in danger, which is what a lot of people don't really do in horror movies. She didn't stop running to look behind her, and she really didn't run while also looking behind her, slowing her down. Unlike a lot of people in horror movies who want to run while looking behind them, or they stop running to see if the coast is clear, if they should keep on running, even though they haven't found, you know, a safe haven yet. So Brunhilde found a dead body, got the hell out of the water, only stopped to put her clothes back on, and ran to get help from her friends. She stopped in the mansion when they were they weren't there. She saw something that scared her, so she ran to go find him. She didn't stop and look around, and she did what a lot of people you don't see in horror movies. They either freeze, or they run while looking behind them, or they stop for unknown reasons, and the killer catches up. She didn't do any of that, so she did more than the average person, so... She went a little bit higher, earning herself two and a half nails in the coffin. The killer is walking outside the house, and he knocks over a flower pot. Bobby was sitting in the house. He hears this noise. He goes up to check where it came from. He goes to the front door, and he opens it, and then he's met with the bill hook to the face with a very nice effect for 1971. Bobby is bestowed upon with one and a half nails in a coffin. Now, frequently in horror movies, we encounter a very common scenario where the character opens a door or turns a corner only to find someone holding a weapon overhead. Instead of reacting instinctively, the victim often freezes and remains like motionless until they're inevitably struck with the weapon. And it kind of raises the question on whether reflexes really exist in the realm of horror movies. One might expect that, you know, you see some danger, the natural response would be, hey, let me move away real quick. Let me take some evasive action rather than just automatically succumbing to some type of paralysis. I don't know. I think if he moved when he was hit, he would have earned more nails. But maybe I'm too a little bit too apprehensive on this one. Like, I, I'm very jumpy as it is. I think if you open a door, see somebody, I think your instinct should be like, oh, shit. Say something instead of just staring at it, you know, with your mouth open and your eyes wide open and like, Oh crap, what do I do? I think your reflex, a natural human reflex, would move or do something. He never really moved or did anything, so I'd take some points away, giving him one and a half nails in a coffin. The next kill is one we saw that got paid homage to in Friday the 13th Part 2, 11 years later. So we currently have Duke and Denise in the middle of making friends with each other, and amidst this intimate moment, the killer seizes the opportunity, impaling both of them with a spear simultaneously in a very macabre two-for-one kill. Like the kill, I'm going to nail these two at the same time, and I'm going to give them two nails in a coffin. They never knew what hit them till it was too late. It, it kind of looked like they completed the transaction after they were impaled, so really not a not really a bad way to go, but unlike Friday the 13th Part 2, no one saw the killer at any time. Nothing they could have done, and that's going to earn them two nails in a coffin. Quick sum up of the next 20 minutes, because a lot of stuff kind of happens. We meet Psychic Adder and her husband Paolo, who is an entomologist. They reside at the Bay. They share a neighborhood with Frank, that real estate agent. There's Renata, Filippo's daughter, and her husband, Albert. She's up at the bay searching for answers about her father's disappearance. And the two couples are talking about the Contessa's will and who shall really inherit the bay. This is where Renata finds out that the Contessa's illegitimate son, Simon, she didn't know he existed. So he also lives up by the bay. So Renata and Albert go find him to ask him some questions. Renata and Albert find Simon. They're having a conversation with him down by the bay. And Renata notices something strange in the boat next to her. And you can see the concern on Simon's face. She moves a tarp and they find a bloated corpse of her father. Simon tells the couple that he found him in the bay and she's distraught at the sight of her deceased father. So Albert takes her to Frank's house, which is close by so she can compose herself. Albert then goes to look for Frank while Renata is left on the couch. She next goes to the bathroom to splash some water on her face. And when she turns the light on, she shockingly finds the four bodies of the teenagers from earlier on in the film. While Renata is trying to process her findings, Frank shows her with the hatchet and attacks her. He's trying to break down the door, and Renata is trying to hold it shut. She grabs a pair of scissors and stabs it through the door into Frank's leg, hitting his femoral artery, and she runs away. Albert sees Paolo running out of Frank's house since he found Frank's body in the ground, thinking he's dead. He's just passed out. 
Albert runs into Renata and she tells him that she did that to Frank. And then she orders Albert to stop Paolo from calling the police because he's going to ruin everything. Albert catches up to Paolo while he's on the phone attempting to call the authorities. But before Paolo can actually connect to the cops and speak to somebody, Albert grabs a phone cord and strangles Paolo to death with it. Paolo is awarded one and a half nails in a coffin. You know, watching his death, it took him a moment to bring his hands up to his neck. He was almost kind of slow to react. Again, I've never been garroted with the phone cord. But I would imagine I would be moving a lot more than Apollo was. I just didn't see enough for him to warrant any more than one and a half nails in the coffin. We then see Anna walking around Frank's house. She finds him still unconscious on the floor, thinking he's dead, presumably. Um, she's focused on his leg, and she moves to get a closer look at the wound, and she's kind of examining the scene. She glasses over to see the scissors, and it looks like she's having one of her psychic visions. We then see a hatchet raise up, and it's brought down fast, cutting off Anna's head in the process. I'm going to give Anna two nails in a coffin. I just didn't see any foolish actions on her part. She seemed, you know, really engrossed in a vision while looking at this crime scene. I mean, you can say that, you know, given the presence of a murder, being alone was unwise, but that was, very, that was the only misstep I could find to give Anna, but she really never really saw this coming, so I really can't take too many points away from her so i'm gonna be generous i guess and give her two nails in the coffin julia arrives back home looking for frank and she actually finds him crawling across the floor you know injured from his stab wound she's asking what happened and all he can tell her is to go get simon and bring him back to him julia runs down to the shack to go get simon and she finds him there but he then locks the door behind him and this is concerning to julia he tells her he knows of the entire plan her frank and filippo had she said, hey, the plan was just for her to seduce Filippo and have Filippo convince, you know, the Contessa to sell. But Simon doesn't want to hear any of it. It's all BS to him. And he holds her just as responsible for his mother's death as he holds Frank and Filippo. Simon is going in for Julia, but she grabs a convenient pot of boiling water that was next to her and splashes it on Simon's face. While he's screaming in pain, she goes for the door, but he grabs her legs and she trips. He gets on top of her. There's a struggle back and forth, but Simon gets his hands around her throat and with a lot of anger in his eyes, he strangles her to death. Miss Julia earned herself two and a half nails in a coffin. You know, she was prepared to defend herself, already, already noticing the pot of boiling water. She knew it was there. As soon as Simon got too close, she knew to use it. He should try to get away, and I feel like she was the victim of some bad writing rather than her making an error. What I mean is, Simon recovered rather quick after having boiling water splashed on his face. And this water was at a rolling boil. You'd be screaming in pain for a lot longer than he was and your face would be all melted off. Which is didn't happen here, which is why he was able to get to her so fast. Resulting in him overpowering her and killing her. But yeah, I think I should give her, gotta give her a lot of credit here. She did really well in this movie. So I'm gonna give her two and a half nails in the coffin. After killing Julia, Simon walks back towards Frank's house, I presume. I have to mention the score right here. It slows the pace down quite a bit, and it really sells what Simon is thinking right now. He stops for a moment. He was reflecting on a plan laid forth by Frank, and you can feel his sense of anger and betrayal. So he storms off, carrying the billhook. Right after he walks off screen, we then jump to him getting impaled with a spear, courtesy of Albert. This one had me puzzled for a moment. I finally settled on giving Simon... One and a half nails in a coffin. Now granted, we don't see enough of how he was attacked, but my guess is he just walked right into Albert with the spear. I don't think he was paying attention or showing any urgency after killing Julia. When he was hit, his back was already up against the wall, and he never had his arms down by the spear trying to get a hold of it. You know, just to push it back or something to get it back out of him. His arms were always up. And just based on what I saw here, I'm only going to give him one and a half nails in the coffin because he was carrying the bill hook, and I just don't understand how Albert got that much of a jump onto him. I think he wasn't paying attention to something, so I got to take points away from that and give Simon one and a half nails. Renata and Albert are now ransacking Frank's place, looking for the document Frank had Simon signed. Right as Albert finds this document, Renata calls for him to look out right as the lights are turned out. Albert lights a match and he's looking around the room. Eventually, Frank jumps out and surprise attacks Albert. They fight back and forth in, in the dark for a moment. You can't see much of it. Frank has a pair of scissors and he's trying to stab Albert. Renata shows up right as we see a gleam of light on his scissors. Right as it's plunged into someone with the... Ugh! Well, that person was Frank and he secured himself 
two nails in a coffin. We only saw the initial attack of this altercation. It was all in the dark, which makes it difficult to really analyze. But I will give Frank credit for getting back up after being stabbed in his femoral artery. He was attacking someone he knew was out to kill him. Not having much to go on, I normally give a kill like this a pass since we didn't see enough of it. However, the fact that after being stabbed, he still had a survival instinct. Granted, he wasn't a nice guy. You know, trying to con people out of selling their property. Um, he did get back up and he was trying to defend his house and himself. Even though he already had a stab wound. Hey, you didn't do you didn't do it well, but I think he did enough to earn two nails in a coffin. We only have it or not that and Albert left. They burn all the paperwork evidence and they're talking about how they are now in the clear. They have an embrace while standing in the back of their car, then their two kids call out, Mommy, Daddy. They look and then they're both shot to death by their young son. These two died together and I'm gonna nail them together and give them two nails in a coffin. There is no way they could have predicted that their son would blow them away with the shotgun. They both had survival instincts in this movie with Albert killing Frank and Rennie stabbing him. Um, Albert also killed Simon. Once they saw their son with the gun pointed at them, he fired and they were dead. They really had no time to react. And just about everybody in this movie was crooked. There are really no heroes in this film at all. You don't see that too often in a slasher. And we're going to include the kids in that. They're little bastards. But they... Thought mommy and daddy were just pretending to play dead. So it's really kind of weird, this ending. But, um, yeah, they weren't playing dead. But they both definitely have two nails in a the coffin. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. Those are all my nails in a coffin for Mario Bava's A Bay of Blood. Here's a summary of all the nails I've awarded. The average nails in a coffin for A Bay of Blood is 1.92 nails which is right on par for what I expect from a slasher. Here's the average nails in a coffin for all the first three Jello movies I've covered so far. So, A Blade in the Dark with 1.5 nails, Deep Red slightly higher with 1.58 nails, and Bay of, A Bay of Blood leading the pack right now with 1.92 nails in a coffin. want to say thanks a lot if you're still watching here. I truly, truly appreciate it. I really like this movie. It's probably my favorite Jalo along with uh, Blade in the Dark, but I got a lot more Jalo to watch. Um, and both of these movies from a different Baba, so I really like his style. So watching this movie, you can really see how it helped set the stage for the slasher boom of the 80s. Excellent, excellent Jalo. Lovely movie. Lovely everything about it. It's, it's a. Uh, let me know what you think of this movie because I, I just simply adore it. Well, thanks for watching. Please like, comment, share, subscribe. Help me grow this channel and grow this community. I greatly appreciate it. Every little like and view I get. I thank you guys. Please share it around. So I'll see you here next week when I continue nailing some more Jalo films with another film by Shano Legend, Dario Argento. So take care, stay safe, and be good to each other. I am your friendly neighborhood Uncle Pete. Remember, with great kills, they must also come. Great nails.